Hi everyone. Hi, G Hi Jody. I can see that you have never used Zoom before. Welcome. I'm not quite sure how you got through COVID-19 having never been introduced to Zoom before, but I am thrilled that this is your first experience. So welcome to you and welcome to everybody who joined tonight. Thank you so much. You know, it's tricky. I know that Christy and Emma would have put a lot of time and thought into what time to make it because, you know, obviously seven o'clock doesn't suit everyone, but it's so um, good that you could make it tonight if you're joining us or if you're watching this recording down the track. Thank you for doing so. Um, tonight we are going to be talking about connections and communication. And we're really focusing on those topics because of World MS Day coming up this weekend and because of a theme that they're doing this year. If you have had a chance to have a look at the MS International Federation website, MSIF website, it has a lot of fantastic information on that website. And it might be a great place to go if you're interested in seeing what else is happening around the world for MS Week this year, 2021. Um, but for this little moment in time, we're going to be concentrating on connections and communication. I would love for this to be interactive. If you would like to ask me questions or comment, I would love you to do that. Um, head over to the little chat panel on the side. It can be on the side of your screen, depending on your computer setup, I guess. And there's a little tab down the bottom of your screen. Um, if you wave your arrow around, it will pop up and you'll see chat and you can click on chat and you can say things if you'd like to down the side. I am also going to share my screen. So I'm going to show you. Ooh, I thought it wasn't going to let me there for a second, but we've practiced. So we know it's coming. Here it comes. And you will see my PowerPoint presentation come up, I hope. That should happen now. I'm going to make it the full size PowerPoint presentation in a sec. And what I think will happen is that my head will become smaller on your screen and maybe push over to the side. Um, and the presentation itself should oh there we go should be bigger so what I find that I do is I move the little screen of myself around to avoid getting in the way of the writing you can do what I be what you can push me right away so you don't see my face and just concentrate on the PowerPoint slides or I think you might even be able to make it bigger so you see me bigger and PowerPoint slides smaller I don't know I should stop talking about it here we go we're talking about connections and communication in MS today so firstly, I wanted to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about me so that you have a bit of an understanding of as to why I'm so passionate um, working in the area that I do. So I'm a psychologist. Uh, the, the business that I run is called Focused Health Psychology. I only have one other psychologist that works with me. Her name is Siona, and she and I both have a specific interest in working with people with MS. That's the main um, part of the work that we do. Sometimes we work as psychologists, you know, in therapeutic counselling setting with support people, people in relationships with people with MS, maybe the children of people with MS. Um, but most of our work is focused around the neurological condition, most of it MS. I am interested in this area because I was diagnosed with MS in 2001. Um, I had finished a science degree. I had done my postgraduate diploma in psychology and I decided I wanted to continue on and do a doctorate in health psychology. My parents said maybe I could think about getting a job but I decided to continue on with my study and I wanted to look at health psychology, become a psychologist in the area of health psychology because I was interested in how physical health and psychological health are connected. I didn't know anything about MS at this point. I just wanted to do my study in this area. And then I was diagnosed with MS in that first six months of, of being in this degree at university. And I hadn't figured out my thesis topic yet. So I took a little bit of time off, tried to get my head around what a diagnosis of MS means, because that's not an easy task, trying to get your head around that. And, and then I decided I was going to do research into this area. I, I really wanted to be able to do some research where at the end of the research, I could print a brochure and that brochure could be handed out by neurologists to people newly diagnosed to tell them what coping strategies they needed in order to cope with this diagnosis. That's what I really wanted to be able to produce. So I looked at people newly diagnosed with MS and the coping strategies that they reported were fantastic or were terrible for them in the first 12 months following diagnosis. And it won't surprise anybody on this webinar to realise that there is no one brochure that can be printed 
because everybody diagnosed with MS is different and each of those individuals have their own unique set of coping skills and strategies. So that's what I learned during my very long drawn out research career doing this research, um, that everybody is different. And we know that coping strategies fall into roughly kind of two camps, the really, really good ones and the really bad ones. We call them maladaptive coping strategies. So the really good ones are the ones that you'd be able to tell me. They're having good social supports. They are a good diet, good exercise. They are talking about your feelings. They are about being active. They're about having goals, setting goals, meeting goals, great coping strategies, relaxation, maybe some mindfulness, um, lots of good ones in there. The maladaptive coping strategies that you might dabble in occasionally include things like drinking too much, taking other drugs to escape your problems. I guess a lot of the maladaptive coping strategies are around escapism. What we're seeing, interestingly now, to go right off topic, interestingly now we're seeing a lot of people engaging in things like gaming. Gaming is a great source of escapism. You get completely lost in this world that has nothing to do with your real world problems. So it's very tempting. We know that the same um, hormones, the same chemicals in your brain are triggered if you're gaming and addicted to gaming as they are if you are having heroin. So there's a whole lot of pull towards that as escapism. Um, anyway, they're the not so good coping strategies. So I did some research into them. I should stop talking about that. And um, really loved what I learned. I mean, nobody can argue that MS is a tremendously fascinating disease. It affects everyone so very differently and people cope with it differently as well. So I really was pulled into this area uh, with passion, not only to learn about my own experience of what this was gonna be like for me, you know, in the years to come, but also in trying to figure out, ah, how does this work with psychology and, and helping people as a psychologist cope with a diagnosis of MS. So that's a bit of my background. And that's why after becoming um, a psychologist, I really wanted to work with this population as well. So that's my thesis topic. It's always very important if you're a researcher to have a colon or a semicolon in your research title. It makes people think that's very important. Taking control while attempting to adapt to perspectives of people with MS. It was done a long time ago now. Can't believe how long. But needless to say, I love the topic of communication and the importance of connections. It's so important to every one of us in so many areas of our life. And arguably, it's really, really important for people with MS to have a good hard look at the way they communicate with people in their lives about their MS, about their symptoms, and about what support they might need. And I guess that's really a good summary of what we're going to be looking at today or tonight. But because Christy and Emma let me put together a PowerPoint presentation, um, I thought that I could show you photos of my children. So here is Hamish, and I'm using them as examples of communication. So don't think it's too obscure, but this is Hamish. Hamish is, is in year seven this year. He did grade six during COVID. And as some of you know, I'm based in Melbourne. We, we did it tough in terms of homeschooling last year. Hamish was a sports captain in grade six. He had done his best for his whole primary school career, he tells us, to head towards the ultimate of being a sports captain, a house captain in grade six, and he got it. And then he was basically at home for two and a half terms. So this is him on his day of graduation, which was in the open air basketball court. Thank God it didn't rain. And Hamish's communication style is communicate as often as you can about everything that comes to mind. So you might have gathered already that I am a relatively verbose communicator. I like to use a lot of words and Hamish didn't fall far from my tree. So he talks about a lot all the time and is keen to share how he feels about things. He's keen to tell me about the experiences of the day and how he feels looking forward. So I'm soaking it up because every woman out there or man out there that has children older than mine, Hamish is 12, tells me that this might change in coming years. So I'm trying to soak it up. But if any of you have children of a similar age, there's only so many detail I need to know about Minecraft. So that's sometimes very difficult. 
Here is Eloise. Eloise is my 10 year old. She's in grade five. Eloise is a very different communicator. Eloise watches everything and she keeps her cards close to her chest. I have to speak softly because they're out there somewhere. <laughs> she keeps her cards close and she takes it all in. So during COVID, during lockdown last year, please, we hope that doesn't happen again. Um, she struggled a little bit more with homeschooling than I knew about because she keeps it to herself. So when my husband and I would ask her how has work going for school, how are you going, how are you finding it, it's okay. She wouldn't give us much. And then one day when I finished work in the morning, I would work up here in my study, they would work in their bedrooms or in the lounge room, and I would come out to meet them for recess and for lunch. And as I came out one day for recess, Eloise had created a sign written a note on a sign and was walking around the kitchen table so that when I came out I would see her it was basically marching around the kitchen table and her sign said I hate maths a different way of communicating needless to say we had we sat down and we had a little chat about maths and we discovered that this had been building for a long time but Eloise, for lots of reasons, didn't want to tell us. And, and that's fine. Um, but isn't it interesting that two children can communicate so differently and it's up to her and it's up to me. It's up to two parties in the relationship to figure out how best to navigate the preferred styles. She prefers to keep it to herself. She doesn't want to talk about the difficulties. I prefer to hear every detail of any problem that my children are facing but we need to come and find a middle ground. So thank you for letting me share my photos with you. Now we'll get into the real presentation. Let's talk about connection first. Why do we need to connect? Let's have a look at the basics because I know that this isn't rocket science. We need to connect because for the basic human need of transferring of information, we need to connect with other human beings so we can let them know what we plan to do, where we need to stay safe, um, how to discuss concepts of great importance. We need to share information as a base level. Primarily, if you really go back a long, long way, let's go back to the caveman, we need to connect, we need to share information to feel safe. We need to be part of a community. We need to be connected so that we know that we're in a pack. Essentially, if we take it right back, we're in a pack of people that have got our backs. We're looking out for them. They're looking out for us. So these are the big kind of fundamentals of why we feel the need to connect. And of course, as we know now, it's for social health. It's for emotional health and psychological health and we group all of these things and more under that big banner that is mental health. It is imperative for us to have the right amount of connections for us. So don't get me wrong, I don't think that everybody needs to go to big loud parties every day of the week. I don't think that you need to have 50 close friends I don't think that you need to be on first name basis with all of the neighbours up and down your street. But I think that human beings need to have significant and genuine connections with a number of other human beings, not just one important person in your life, but a number. We need a bit of a spread. Not only because if something happens to the one important person in your life, then you're left with no one, that's not good. We need to spread our social resources around a bit, but also because it keeps us feeling connected and needed. It's not just about other people providing us with support. It's actually really important for most human beings to feel as though they're providing support to others. And it's, it's important for us to consider, even if we feel like we can barely get up in the morning, even if we feel like we are super depressed, super anxious, super unable to do what we would like to be doing. One of the best things you can do to maintain a good sense of resilience and to maintain a good mental health status is to be actively engaged in providing support to other people. Gee, Zoom's hard because I'd love to know if people are nodding or if they're going, oh yeah, I've heard that before 
or yes, you know. So I hope that you're with me. I hope you're with me in, in what I'm saying. So how do we typically connect with other people? Well, of course, traditionally, it's always been face to face. And yes, back in the caveman times, there were very few other options, maybe a good yell, a cooey over a through a valley, maybe, maybe not over a mountain, I don't think cooey works that way. But over a, across a valley, sure. But face to face is the big one. And I have always loved face to face meetings. I'm one of those people that really doesn't like talking on the phone to friends. You know, you've got some people in the world that love, they have an hour conversation with their mum every night or they have 20 minute phone calls with five of their friends every day. I am not that person. I am the person that says, oh, hey, why are you calling me? Like, if you want to talk, can we meet for coffee? Like, I'm not, I'm not doing this on the phone. I need to see, I prefer to see facial expressions. And obviously I use a lot of hand gestures. So I really communicate well face to face. Telephone, of course, this is another way to connect and you can get used to it. You know, when my parents-in-law live in South Australia and we can get used to telephone and making meaningful connections in all sorts of ways if we are made to, if we can't catch up face-to-face. -face. Here is Zoom. I had to put it as number three. It has transferred my view of providing therapy to people. 2019 was, uh, sorry, 2020 was a very, very interesting year of adapting and pivoting and all the speak that they gave us the politicians gave us but boy it's worked and of course with zoom you can see all of these ridiculous hand gestures that i make and my face and my smiling and hopefully my concern and my care particularly in relationships that we've already had that face-to-face -face contact with you can quite easily slide into zoom once you get your head around the technology it can work quite well social media is an interesting one Mm, for so many reasons, because we can connect well on social media, but it's not always the most health promoting way of connection. I talk to lots of people in my work who have a fairly tenuous relationship with Facebook. They find it either great because they are able to connect with family or friends in ways that they wouldn't otherwise connect. And I have some people that find it very highly anxiety. Uh, provoking and really difficult to navigate because a comment on Facebook can be taken a million different ways and is often taken in a way that maybe it wasn't intended to be. Or dare I say an absence of a comment can be really detrimental to someone's mental health even if somebody didn't intend to not comment they just didn't see the post. You can tell how old I am by the fact that I use Facebook as the example. My children to reassure me that that is the old person's social media. So you might all be out there on Snapchat, Instagram, things that I like TikTok. I'm not on TikTok, but my, you know, my son is on. I know it a little bit, but I don't really get it. Snapchat, I'm trying my hardest. The filters are fun, but I don't really know how to connect with people over it. You can tell me about that if you want. I can see people commenting, actually. Let me just have a oh, let me just have a quick chat. Oh, yeah, oh, good. I've had to bring up another little window just so I can see what people are saying. Yes, you're nodding. Thank you, people. Um, yes, no, I'm not doing another PhD topic of gaming for people with MS. That's too scary. Thank you. Just another PhD that gives me hot flushes or cold sweats just thinking about that kind of research. Yeah. Oh, good. You like Facebook to connect with people you knew from the Northern Territory. Brilliant. And that's, I think that's Facebook in its finest form. You know, when you're really connecting with people that you've had meaningful relationships with before, that you can stay connected with through Facebook or any of the other ones. Now, I've brought up the little um, dot point there of peer support groups. So see how our connection and our communications presentation now is moving into more of an MS focus. Like, let's start talking about connections because we have MS or despite having MS, um, or to help us with support because we have MS, let's go there. Peer support groups, amazing to connect with other people who have a lived experience of MS. Does that mean that they'll have the same symptoms as you? Of course not. Does that mean that they'll have a better understanding of how difficult it is to talk to other people who don't have MS about MS symptoms? Yes. Yes, it does. Most people I've found in peer support groups, they have this ability to provide 
quiet understanding and support without trying to fix it, not trying to fix it, but just having a presence, just hearing you, just being able to say, yes, that sounds tough. That's a big deal. It can mean an awful lot. And we also connect through shared interests. So we connect in a variety of ways with people intentionally, but we also connect with people who we wouldn't necessarily intend to have made a connection with. So if you play a particular sport, if you've got a hobby, if you're a school mum, or if you go to school yourself, or if you go to a workplace, you are forming lots of connections with people incidentally, maybe, um, and by design. And in society, really incidental ones. But they can be often very interesting connections, can't they? If you bump into something in a car, somebody in a car park, if you are in a shopping centre and you happen to be watching a particularly interesting, you know, something happens that's a bit out of the blue and the person next to you is watching the same thing and then you make a comment to each other. I love those connections. I love those little shared moments where you know you're never going to see that person again, but the two of you had a moment because you saw, I don't know, the child in the trolley or somebody doing something funny or, you know. We connect a lot. Why do we communicate? <clears throat> to navigate our world, as I've said before, to share with, with each other. So there are great communicators in this world. There are people that talk a lot. There are some people who don't say much but communicate so beautifully and so well with minimal words. My husband is like that. I just talk and talk and talk and talk and he just sums it up in like one perfect sentence. He gets very tired just from listening to me. Um, we communicate so that we can understand what's going on. And through that understanding of what's going on with other people in our world, this helps us build friendships and relationships. Do you know, at university, when I was doing my undergraduate, I did a science degree, but one of my majors, so this is going to sound strange, was philosophy. It was so good. You know, how often do you get to sit around and study philosophy? So it was brilliant. I can't believe they let me do it as part of a science degree, but it was fantastic. And one of the subjects I did in philosophy was around friendship. And I loved this theory of friendship, which was just about the sharing of information. And I think you would all be able to have a think about the varying levels of friends that you have. You know, some people that you are so close to, they know everything about you. They almost know how you think. They know how you are wired. And then you also have friends, family, acquaintances that you know who you're great friends with, but there's a differing level of friendship there. And this theory of friendship that I learned about said it's really about how much intimate detail you share with someone and when and how it's reciprocated. So you share a little bit with them and they share a little bit back with you. And then you might share something that's a little bit more personal and they share something that's a little bit more personal. And if it's the same even sharing, up, step, 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 then that builds a great, great friendship. You, I know it's, it sounds simple, but you might know somebody who has tried to overshare with you a little bit where you think, oh, that was a bit too much information. Like I'm not that good a friend with you and why are you giving me all of this big bulk of information? That is somebody, like they're demonstrating that kind of uneven balance where they may be presuming that we're at a different level of friendship than we are. Or I hope you've never had this experience where you start talking about something and you have that horror, that realisation, I could be oversharing here because this person's giving me a little bit of a blank look. Right. So it's really interesting having a good hard look at how we communicate with others, what we say and why we're saying it and how that builds our friendships and our relationships. This obviously communication can be used beautifully to support other people, but it can also help others support us. And this is a really important point to tonight. The way we communicate to others about our multiple sclerosis and the symptoms and our needs will help them support us in the way that we want to be supported. It's really important because they don't know what they don't know and they don't know how we want to be supported unless we can tell them. And it's tough. None of that's easy. <clears throat> Let's keep going. Oh, I've got to move my little 
screen so I can read my notes. What this presentation doesn't cover is really about how MS um, was communicated to you when you were diagnosed, the role models that you might have had about people living with MS before you were diagnosed with MS. Those role models are so important to your psychological processing of what does this diagnosis mean for me? And how am I going to incorporate this into my view of myself moving forward? Role models, people that you knew that had MS before you were diagnosed with MS are incredibly important, but we're not going to cover that today. That's for another webinar another time. Also, we're not going to look at the communication that you get about MS through various channels like Google, blogs, research. And the importance of communicating well with your health professionals is something I am super, super passionate about. And it is also another topic for another time. But the how we choose to communicate our symptoms to health professionals, particularly neurologists, often MS nurses. And now um, with people's involvement in the NDIS, all of a sudden people with MS have so much more involvement with allied health professionals, which is fantastic. But, and support workers, but we really need to be mindful of how we communicate with them as well for best outcomes for us and for them. So that's for another day as well. We're not going to be looking at the communication difficulties in MS in terms of the biological difficulties, you know, the motor difficulties with speech disturbances, and it's getting late at night, so you never know what kind of slurring I'm going to be coming out with, but it can happen. Cognitive dysfunctional word finding. Now I'm going to put pressure on myself to make sure I find all the right words. And fatigue. If you are somebody with MS listening tonight and you have fatigue in your life, you know just how impactful it can be on your communication towards the end of the day or your communication at the end of a long week. So communication difficulties are real for people with MS. I'm just going to have a quick look at the chat because I think other people might also be talking about these communication problems. Yes, and I'm not going to read that all out. And I actually think you can probably all read them as well. Um, yes, in your jammies. Oh, good on you. Emma's watching in her jammies. I think that was Emma saying that. Um, okay, I'll stop looking at that and I'll keep going or we'll never finish. What are we looking at tonight? Communication by you about your MS to the people that are most important to you. That's going to be the bulk of the messages for tonight. Now, I'm going to use the word partner a lot. That's annoying if you don't have a partner. But what I want you to put in the place of that is just the person that you love the most, the person that loves, them, loves you the most in the world. It could be your flatmate, the person you're closest with. It could be your child, adult child, if you're talking about what I'm going to be talking about. It could be your best friend, your neighbour, your cousin, anybody. Um, but I will often use the word partner. So think about the person that it's most important that you are communicating well with. That's the person we're talking about tonight. And then we're going to drop down into friends, acquaintances, employers. And I also thought it would be a good idea to have a look at how do you communicate with the people that tell you that they know the cure? And like maybe if you just exercised more, you wouldn't be so tired. Or... If you get on this diet, can you hear the tone in my voice? If you get on this diet, you'll be fine because my neighbour has MS and she's fine. Gee, I hope that people are nodding as well with my use of sarcasm. But sometimes it's important for us as people with MS to have to think about what are the messages I need to remember when the next person at the Christmas party or the barbecue or the family catch-up or a random person in the supermarket decides they need to tell me how to cure my MS it might be a good idea for you to have a couple of strategies at the ready. And that's where we go for strategic and effective communication. That's what we're looking at tonight. That's what we're hoping for. So let's start by saying, if we look at the partner relationship, if we look at the relationship that's most important to you, I want you to have a think about this. MS is in the relationship. It just happens to be in your body. It happens to be in your body, not the body of the person you're in the relationship with, it's in your body, but MS is impactful. It is a big deal in the relationship. It's a big deal for both of you. Communication is therefore of utmost importance because if the MS is in your body, you're the one that has to communicate it to the other person that doesn't get to have it in their body. That's a weird way to say it. I'm sure they don't want it in their body, but they don't have it. So they don't know 
how these invisible symptoms are impacting on you today, now, yesterday, tomorrow, how you feel they might be next weekend when they're planning that massive party and having everyone at your house. They don't know your fatigue levels unless you share that with them. We're looking for strategic communication. We're looking for effective communication, not comfortable, because it's not comfortable to be telling our partners that we are so tired and we can't even fathom the idea of a party next weekend on Monday. Nobody wants to be that person. Nobody wants to say it. But it's not very effective if we don't communicate with them everything that's going on in here, which is the invisible stuff. So I, I've created if you like, a little bit of a continuum to explain this concept. And um, there's also a little animation which is happening after this slide about this. So let's go with the continuum first. I work with lots of people with MS and sometimes occasionally I'll meet people on the polar ends of this um, continuum. Some people with MS fall into quite a lot, actually, you might be one of them, fall into a category of everything's fine. I've been diagnosed with MS. I told people a little bit about it to begin with and told my partner, say the person I love the most, all about my invisible symptoms. But, you know, I got really bored of hearing it myself. So I just decided to stop talking about it because my partner can't fix it anyway. So I'm just going to say everything's fine. I'm fine. I mean, I'm tired, but I'm fine. And we think, I, fall, I fell into this category as well, we think this is a good strategy. When you're first diagnosed and you think, I don't want to talk about it all the time, we think it's a good strategy, but it's not. It's not a good strategy. Shutting it down and not talking about MS is not a good strategy. If you take anything from today, that's a good one. Don't be the everything's fine person. This is the person that refuses to, I'm not going to complain about it. I don't want my partner to worry about me because they can't fix it. So I'm not going to say anything. And I don't want them to just say MS on my forehead. I want them to remember I'm still me. The problem with this approach to communication is that you just forego a certain level of honesty because that person probably wants in. They want to know about it. They are going through this too. The MS is in the relationship. Remember, it just happens to be in your body. So let them in, let them in. You need to tell them what's going on or else they don't get a realistic understanding of what's going on. And we don't want to set up unrealistic expectations of what you can do, your energy levels, etc. And we also don't want to reduce their knowledge and their understanding of what's going on because they will forget you've got MS, which sounds so appealing, but can be really difficult because after 20 years, we can go a bit like this and you are saying to me in a therapy room, he has no idea what I go through in my MS. And he says to his friends, MS doesn't even affect her. She's doing really well. We're so lucky. I wish I could see you and have people go, oh, but I hope that you get what I'm saying. We can just create this unrealistic expectation in our partners or our loved ones. They really don't understand because we haven't let them in. We need to educate them without um, making them feel bad, without expecting them to fix it, because we know they can't. But we need to tell them all about that. Sometimes I see people that are like, I've got MS, so there's nobody worse off in the world than me, and everybody else has nothing to complain about. Luckily, I don't see many of these people because that's not a nice way to be. We don't want to send our partners messages that nothing they do can help us. And we don't want to reinforce their helplessness that, you know, my life is so bad now and nothing they can do to will change it because we will also get this over time where they would just stop caring, to be honest, because we will keep complaining about it or telling them that even if they've had a hard day at work, it's nothing in comparison to our MS. That's not a good way to communicate with anyone, let alone the people we love the most. Ooh. So I clicked the wrong button then, so I hope you can still all hear me. Um, the it, this will change the dynamic of the relationship and often partners will stop being able to see you for you. They'll just see you as being a big ball of MS because that's all you talk about. And we certainly don't want that. We don't want them to tune out or avoid us. Oh, so I'm going to have a drink and I am going to um, press play on this. This is an animation um, that tries to talk a bit more about the communication continuum. So let's see how this goes. After you were diagnosed with MS, you might have left the neurologist's oh. 
office, told your family, called a few friends, disclosed it to your boss, and posted it on social media. A problem shared is a problem halved, right? Or you might have left the neurologist's office and gone home. Your diagnosis of MS is private and you don't have to share it with anyone, right? By the time you have had MS for 12 months or more, you have set up a pretty solid communication style about your MS with the people you love most in the world. The MS communication continuum suggests that everyone with MS falls somewhere on the continuum regarding how they communicate their MS symptoms and concerns. On the left hand side is the person with MS who says nothing about their symptoms to the people they love. This guy thinks, what's the point in talking about it? My loved ones can't fix it, so why would they want to hear about it? It would be better for everyone if I just say nothing. On the right hand side of the continuum is the person with MS who talks a lot about their symptoms and how hard it is to live with MS all the time. This person thinks, I have to talk about it all the time because my family needs to know how hard it is for me. I have to tell them that I am struggling all the time because nobody understands what I'm going through. Can you see the problem with both of these approaches? One is not sharing enough information and one is sharing too much or too often. Both people are just doing what's comfortable for them and what they think is best for everyone. But when you have MS, you shouldn't be aiming for comfortable. You should be aiming for effective. Effective communication strategies about your MS symptoms will help the people you love to have a genuine understanding of what you are going through without thinking that you are defined by your MS. It might not be easy opening up to loved ones in a genuine way about the difficulty of living with MS. It might not be easy to talk about other things at times, acknowledging that others have challenges that they are facing in their lives too. But it's really important to aim for effective communication when we live with MS, so that we don't isolate ourselves by not sharing the right info with the right people, and so that we don't end up pushing people away by oversharing our personal MS information. Examining where you sit on the MS communication continuum can help you aim for effective communication with the people you love so that you can get your head around MS. helpful um, around discussing a little bit more about that communication continuum and how we should really just be trying to assist our partners coming towards that middle point as well um, so that they're so we are able to talk about it effectively knowing that it's not always comfortable particularly around new symptoms you know if something new happens I feel like for people with MS, it can take a little bit of time, you know, a couple of days to really bring to the front of your mind that there's a new symptom happening. If you're busy, if you're stressed, if you're just a human and you don't want to think that another new MS symptom is happening, often it is entirely normal to just ignore it for a couple of days and think it'll probably go, I have just need a better sleep, it'll be fine, I don't want to even think about it, let alone talk about it. But I think you should give yourself maybe 48 hours and then about 48 hours after you feel a new symptom happening, it might be a good idea to start verbalising it as well and talking to somebody close to you about what's happening. It might end up being nothing and it might end up that you don't even need to tell your neurologist about it, um, you know, until next time you see them. But it might be worth letting somebody into your genuine experience of MS because not only, you know, does it share the burden, but it also keeps it real. And it keeps it authentic for the person that you care the most about to let them into your world. It's hard though. I don't want to say it's not hard to be that open, but it's really important to maintain a good, strong relationship to keep those communication channels open. Um, yes, which is basically those dot points. Yes, we need to look for the communication style that's best for the relationship, not for the individual, you or them. It's about finding that good midpoint. And in fact, my next slide talks about, oh, does it? 
Yes, this study that was just released, 2021, literally three weeks ago. I don't think in time for World MS Day, but maybe that's part of it. Look, they're very important. They've also put a colon in their, um, their title, but they use the word phenomenological. So that's so much higher than mine. And dyadic dynamics, what does that even mean? It basically just means communication between two people. And it looks at what is the best type of communication for people in a relationship where one person has relapsing remitting MS. And I was so thrilled. This was literally published, you know, a week or two ago, three, four weeks ago. And they have basically reflected what I was talking about as well. We need to look at the two individuals and work, what works well for them and how to assist them having this acceptance, which really is just about honest acknowledgement that MS is existing and it requires their attention. That's, that's what we mean by acceptance often, not about, oh, it's fine. We don't have to say it's great. We don't have to say that we love having MS. That's not what acceptance means. It means let's see it for what it is and discuss it. Let's not use avoidance. We really need to support people with MS in relationships to maintain this emotional communication to keep that relationship strong. And the results of this study demonstrated the importance of supporting the couple before those avoidance strategies kick right in and you end up with that 20 year relationship where one person goes this one way and one person goes this way. So it's true to say we need to avoid the avoidance communication strategies. We are not aiming for this. We are not aiming for people to get better at reading our minds. As much as we know our partners or those closest to us can with a shift of an eye, they know exactly what we're thinking. We don't want to rely on it. Actually using your words is a better way of expressing yourself. So who else do we communicate with? Oh, 7.44. Oh, quick. Now, look, see, I knew that I'd run out of time communicating too much. Quick, next slide. Friends and family, communication by you about your symptoms. So we've discussed the partner or the one person that's closest to you, the nearest and dearest. Let's have a look at your other friends and family and how interesting these communication moments can be because you can have a range of reactions and at the moment, I'm bringing down dot points around your diagnosis. So have a think, because I'm the only one that gets to talk at the moment, which is annoying for everybody. But have a think about your friends and family's responses. Did you have anybody that was overly upset, where the tears were flowing, you know, at a different rate maybe than yours, where it was really disproportionate amount of sadness that was pouring out of them that maybe you were a bit... Um, shocked by it was a bit unexpected or was somebody in your life dismissive about your ms oh whatever you know i hurt my toe yesterday would be an interesting response did you have any inappropriate responses i certainly know that when i was diagnosed with ms my very lovely landlord who really was lovely lovely man um a retired dentist had actually worked a lot with people with MS. So he had seen a lot of difficult presentations of MS. And when he knew that I had been diagnosed, he came and saw me and he said almost tearfully, you know, this is a man who had done a lot of study. He said to me, a doctoral student, Sally, it's important for you to stop studying and just have children while you still can. Now, luckily, I had processed enough by this point to be able to say this man is reacting because of his experience of MS in other people who have experience of who have MS. This is all about him. His response is about him. This is not about me. This is not about my journey with MS. I got the word journey in there. I'm a psychologist. It's mandatory to put journey in every time I present. So this is not about my journey. This is about his journey and it's okay. And I use the same approach with people who were very, very, very upset. I found out really that there were very few exceptions. These people knew other people with MS that were not having a good course of MS and they were really upset because that's where their mind went. And I had one person who was very dismissive very dismissive of my diagnosis, changed the topic almost immediately and told me it wasn't a big deal. Like, why am I talking about it? It's not a big deal. And my husband very astutely said to me one day, 
do you think they have MS? And I was like, don't be ridiculous. They don't have it. They had MS. So they were dismissive, dismissive of my diagnosis because they had been living with MS for quite some time, had never told anyone and wanted me to know that this was not the end of my life, snap out of it, get on with it. But because I didn't know the context, I didn't know they had MS. If I had have known that, that would have been an absolute changer for me, but I didn't. So, but, but when I realised, when I found out probably six months later that they had MS, I thought, well, that makes sense. So often people respond to us. Their response is all about them. It's not about us. Um, there was also under the hurtful dot point, there was somebody because John and I were about to get married about six, no, about three months after I was diagnosed, we did get married. And one of his good friends said, are you going to stop the wedding? Are you going to break up to John? <gasps> hurtful. He knew me. I was friends with him too, but clearly he might've acted differently. Luckily, my husband is a lovely man. And of course he didn't break up with me. So recognise that their re reactions are about them, not about you. It's a big part of communication in MS, I think. We really have to step back and be conscious if we're taking somebody's response personally because it is often not about us. So we have to be careful not to take everything personally. Let's have a look at acquaintances. Oh, I'm aware of the time. How do you approach a conversation with an acquaintance about MS? So this is the example that I'll give you. The example I'll give is the people that are friends of yours now, but they weren't friends of yours when you were diagnosed. So, you know, I'm up to 20 years of diagnosis this year. I can't believe it. And so there, I've made lots and lots of friends, thank goodness, since being diagnosed so long ago. And one group of friends were the friends of my kids' school friends' parents. Made friends with this new group of people. Fantastic. And occurred to me one day, I really need to let them in to my world of having MS because if I am in a situation where I need somebody to pick up the kids, if it's MS related or not, these are the people I'm going to be relying on. So why shouldn't I be a little more emotionally genuine with them and give them some information now so that if I have a relapse and I'm in the hospital, I don't dump it all on them at once. I can say, hey, you know how I told you I had MS a little while ago? Would you be able to pick up the kids from school because I'm not in a great way? That will come across in a much better way than me putting the whole story on them at once when I need them. So I suggest to people that if you're thinking about talking to a new group of people about your MS, that you think about your key messages. Think about the approach to the conversation first, of course. What are the key messages that I want to send these people? Do I want to reassure them? I found this to be the way. Do I want to reassure them that this is not a crisis moment I'm having in my life? Because this is going to be big news to anybody. And we need to reassure them that we're just letting them know about a reality that we've been living with for a while now. I think it's always good to invite people to ask questions, always. And I also wanted to plan an out because nobody wants to change the topic after this conversation. Nobody. If they're your friends, they are not going to feel like it's appropriate to change the topic. So you need to give them that gift give them the gift to a uh, permission to change the topic. So this is how it went with my friends in the schoolyard. Hey guys, I've, I've got something that I want to tell you. There were four other women, three other women standing around me and they could tell it was serious because I said, I, I'm not quite sure how to bring it up. So I'm just going to say it. And one of them said, is it cancer? And, and which was beautiful and difficult and what a reaction. And so I had to kind of go there first. No, but you know, it's okay. No, that threw me a little bit. And then I said, hey, guys, I just want to tell you about something that happened ages ago. So this was the reassurance. I was diagnosed years and years and years ago with MS and I'm fine. This is how I was telling them. And I'm fine. But I wanted you to know because I realised that it's something that can go up and down in my life. And because now that we've got this kind of solid friendship and all the kids love each other and they're hanging out and there's playdates and I just really wanted you to know in case one day I need to tell you why I'm really, really tired or maybe one day you'll see me and my leg won't be behaving itself or one day something will happen and I just wanted to give you the heads up now rather than putting a whole big surprise on you down the track if that happens one day. 
and everybody was really nice. And I said two things actually that I didn't put down here. I asked them if they had any questions they could ask me now or down the track. I'm never going to be bothered if you want to ask me a question at any point. And I also reassured them that this is not a secret because some of you may have had experiences where you've asked somebody to keep this a secret please know it, it very rarely works. And it's not because people are mean, but because sometimes it's they're well-intentioned people that think sharing that secret would be a good idea. And maybe it's not a good idea, but once you say something to somebody, it is then their information to share. You need to view it like that. If you tell somebody something personal about you, it is then their information to share with whoever they want. So, I made it clear to them, this is not a secret and I have told my children, my children know. So if you want to tell your kids, then don't tell them to keep it a secret from my kids because it's all open. I also said, look, I haven't told everybody in the school community, just to let them know it's not common knowledge, but I'm not going to be bothered if you talk to other people about it. And then when I thought it was kind of appropriate, people had asked a few questions, but then everybody was just looking really uncomfortable and they weren't quite sure how to look at me, but they were all looking at me with that kind of uncomfortable sympathy, even though I was like, I'm fine. It was a long time ago. I thought I need to give them a gift, which was let's change the topic and talk about your daughter's netball game on Saturday. And I did it in quite a way that everybody came on board and started talking about netball so we could move through a very uncomfortable moment because it was, but it was a really effective way to communicate with people who were going to offer me great support in the years to come. So it was important. And I think they all really appreciate it actually, because it shows a demonstration of um, honesty in my relationship with them and that I trusted them as my friends. It was nice. How do you communicate with employers? It's really important. I'm now just going to have a quick look at the chat as well as, as doing this. Mm. Yes, I'm glad that you've made comments down there. Thank you about what people have tried um, and the communication that they've that you've been subject to, maybe, or the, the moments that you've experienced. Employers are a different group altogether, and I am not an employment lawyer. I am not somebody that works at an employment support service. However, you'll see down the bottom, I've included the number for multiple solutions, which is employment support service that work throughout, I think, South Australia and Northern Territory. And they're linked very closely with the MS Society. I think I think I'm saying the right things. So please call them or the MS Society directly if you want to discuss anything to do with employment and disclosure of your MS or your symptoms with your employers, it's the best thing to do before you broach your employers about this kind of topic. But in conjunction, I would want you to think about some considerations, to have some considerations. Why would you be sharing this information? Because I am not for or against sharing your information of having MS with your employers. I think it is brilliant sometimes, and I think it's a mistake other times. It is so individual. So I would want you to think, why am I wanting to share this information with them? Is it because I need immediate support? I need my desk to be closer to the toilet now because I'm having accidents and I need some help? Or... I can't do another summer without air conditioning. So I need to speak to my manager about my symptoms and my need for air conditioning. So I need that immediate support. Or is it a bit like me talking to the school mums? I just want them to be prepared for the future if something happens. MS is fine in me now, but I want you to know as my employer that this is a chronic health condition I've been working with, sorry, that I've been managing or living with for years. I don't anticipate it impacting on my work, but I want you to be aware just in case something comes up in the future. I think sounds really good, but it's very, very unique. Every individual needs to seek their own guidance around this and to know that they're talking to their employer about it appropriately and for their best interests. I also want people to have a think about what are their desired outcomes? Why would you tell your employer? Have a good hard think about why is it that I'm telling them? And what is it that I want them to give me after this meeting? Do I just want them to pick up a pamphlet and read a bit more about MS? Or do I want them to come back to me with a solution, with a remedy, with an air conditioner? What is it that I want out of the meeting so I can be super clear with them? So once again, I want to suggest that you look to the resources that are available to you if you're considering um, upping your communication with your employers about your MS. Oh, 
I did not mean to stop sharing them. Not a technological wizard. Oh, hang on. Here we are. Are we back? No. <gasps> hang on a second. What have I done? Share again. It's coming. I'm working. I'm working it out. <gasps> there it is. Hmm. Okay. So we are now. I pressed a button I wasn't meant to. Have a look at people who have the cure. So let me know, please, if that's not working, but I think it is. People who have the a cure, look at all these top ones. I really think that we should all plan for this because we will all in our lives come across that one person that says, my boyfriend's cousin has MS and this is what they did. And it will either be they, you know, ate six oranges a day and they are now completely cured of MS. It'll be something really out there or it will be something like they're on, I won't name drugs, but they're on a particular infusion. And since they've been on that infusion, they are like, they've just completely cured themselves of MS. Whereas if you're on a tablet or an injection or the other infusion or whatever, that's not going to work because my boyfriend's cousin told me that nothing else works. Now, it's hard when you are having those conversations with people because, thank you for telling me it's working, by the way, um, because it is really difficult to navigate those, mm, what have I done with my screen? There we go. It's difficult to navigate those conversations, particularly if they're just a shock at the family barbecue where you weren't expecting them. And that's why I think it's really important to have those key messages at the ready. To know that when they talk to you about the cure, they're not talking, they're not, to, they're not interested in you, they're not talking about you, they're talking about them, they're having a conversation about something that they want to talk about. So I always encourage people to go with that, to have the conversation with them about their friend and to be interested and to say, oh, that's really interesting that your friend had this experience. That's really interesting and fantastic that your friend had such great outcomes. And if you're pushed to it, you can say, you know, I'm working really closely with my health team and we're pretty confident that I'm on a um, good course of medication or I'm taking the appropriate steps to best manage my MS. But I'm really pleased that your friend is having that um, response and that great success. So to just kind of reflect back the story that they're giving you about their friend is probably the, the wisest approach to try to counter their somewhat aggressive attempts to convert you to whatever their agenda is about in terms of um, cure of MS. I think it's really important to let people know at any opportunity, whether they're trying to sell you the cure or not, that everybody with MS is different. I think it's good that we all take that torch, carry that torch and educate the community, particularly around MS Awareness Week, everybody with MS is different. The symptoms are experienced differently. The treatments are different. The outcomes are different. The supports are different. The way they communicate about their MS is different. I think it's really important that we all carry that flame and tell everybody that we can, that people with MS are different because it helps us all in those situations. And then just like with our acquaintances, I think it's important to plan an out. Here's an example. Yes, thank you for telling me about your friend's experience with the cure for MS. Um, isn't it interesting? Like there are so many medications now for MS. I guess it's like the coronavirus vaccine. You know, there are so many different vaccines being uh, presented to the world. Have you got your coronavirus vaccine yet? And just bring them a question that's just changed the topic and it brings them back to talking about them and not talking about your MS and trying to fix you. Everybody loves talking about the coronavirus vaccine, don't they? or are we a bit over it? And then I've said, call MS Connect. That's the wrong state. I didn't mean to say that. Call MS Society um, in South Australia and Northern Territory to debrief about those people because sometimes it's important to be able to talk to um, knowledgeable people, which is the MS Society, around whatever QR is being sold to you on 60 Minutes or in the family barbecue. So at the end of today, 8.02. It's we're looking at communication style across a variety of connections in the community. Remember the importance of getting that communication right, particularly with the nearest and dearest and prepare for communication with those other groups of people. What are your key messages that you would like to tell people, um, whether they're close to you or not close to you? And please remember that often their responses are not about you. Their responses are about them. 
So even though it's difficult, sometimes we've got to work on not taking things personally and seek support when appropriate. You know, if you're feeling a bit over it, communicating with lots of people who don't get it, maybe have a think about communicating with others. How to find a psychologist is a slide here. Please call 1-800-812-311, which is your MS Society number, or visit their website. Ask around who's a good psychologist in this area. You know, ask some peer support groups maybe, or the MS Society themselves. They might have a list of people, um, psychologists that have some knowledge in this area. You can contact the APS through their Find a Psychologist service on their website. But I would recommend you just call a few psychologists and have a chat to them. And just before I finish, I wanted to let you know, I'll go, th I'm not even going to talk about all of these things. Um, I've designed an online course for people with MS. So it talks a little bit more about communication, particularly with the person that you're closest to, but it covers other areas as well. Stress management, it's a four module course. Stress management, self-management of a chronic health condition, communicating um, with people in our lives about our MS and also self-identity, who you were before the diagnosis of MS, who you are now living with this disease, with this chronic health condition and trying to get your head around it, which is why it's called MS Get Your Head Around It. It's a long title, but it's um, it just kept telling me that that's what it needed to be called because I find myself so often talking to people with MS about the fact that it's such a difficult thing to get your head around. So there you go, you can check the website for that. And if you're part of the NDIS, um, it can actually be funded through the NDIS. So if that's the case and you would like to access that course, please just send me a direct email and I can sign you up and invoice your MDIS plan manager if that would help. And then you don't have to do the online payment. So thank you. I've got this last slide as a question slide and I've put my email address there on purpose because this format is a bit difficult to do the question answer responses, but I will have a look at your comments in a sec. But you are welcome to email me directly and I know that you are more than welcome to contact the MS Society with follow-up questions from tonight or with questions about any of what I've discussed today. They are there to help and they are there to um, talk to you about any of your MS needs.